first thing the Ridwell refinement technique is the most widely used technique for magnetic structure refinement. Ref I use the word refinement, I have marked it in red because this is not an ab initio solution for crystallographic and magnetic structure. Rather, you start with a given structure, magnetic and crystallographic, and then you keep refining it. So, he said, I wrote here, we need to start with the crystallographic structure for both the structure and magnetic part. So, there is a starting point and then you refine that structure. So, that means while we are doing this uh, fitting program, running this fitting program, we must understand that we are undertaking uh, optimization of the given structure. So, the, this program is available online and as I told you, anybody interested to learn the technique can look into the lectures given in that course. And this is used for both uh, for both X-rays and neutrons all over the world, and tutorials are also available online. So, similar to crystallographic unit cell, now let us come back to magnetic unit cell. Now, crystallographic unit cell we understand where the it is a repetitive cell that through translation gives me the entire crystal. But in case of magnetic unit cell, the magnetic unit cell can be different from the crystallographic unit cell. For example, if I consider an antiferromagnetic sample, then you can see that the, with the simplest example, if I consider crystallographic style linear chain. So in case of ferromagnetic material, the repeat distance is L. Now if it is antiferromagnetic, then neighbor, nearest neighbor, it will be antiferromagnetic, then repeating ferromagnetic, then again antiferromagnetic. The repeat distance has gone to 2L. So L to 2L, 2L, the cell has doubled when it is going from ferro to antiferro. But this is a, one of the simplest possible examples that I can give. There are other kind of uh, unit cells which is commensurate or incommensurate, incommensurate with respect to the crystallographic cell. I will come to it. So there is something called a magnetic, magnetic propagation vector. Now, if from one crystallographic structural unit cell to next the magnetism changes slightly, the magnetic unit cell may be thousands of atoms in there and may have a much larger length scale compared to the crystallographic unit cell. So in that case, for the fitting of our data, we will use the crystallography unit cell and the propagation vector which will use the properties of the crystallographic unit cell and tell me at what distance my magnetic cell is repeating. Like as I showed you in the linear chain, when I go from ferromagnet to antiferromagnet, it goes from ferro L to 2L, the repeat distance. And actually if you go from magnetic uh, from, from ferromagnet to antiferromagnet, if you look at the intensity of Q or 4 pi sin theta by lambda, you will find that intensity because L has goes to 2L, the reciprocal lattice vector has gone to half and you will find that if the ferromagnetic peak matches with the crystallographic peak, the antiferromagnetic peak will be approximately if it is small angle, if theta, sin theta is equal to theta, it will be at half the angle for an antiferromagnetic peak. So you do see a new peak appearing if an antiferromagnetic order takes place. Now that means I have to find out the magnetic propagation vector for the additional peaks. Now here 
the magnetic moment i consider a zero th cell as one of the cells crystallographic or structural cells and then the magnetic moment in this cell at any site i can have components <coughs> in various direction so then i have to write down the magnetic moment at a site so let me just geometrically show so suppose this is my unit cell unit cell and my ma moment this is the ith point in my unit cell and this is the m now <coughs> if i consider a crystallography axis a b and c then this m will have components along a b c and basically that means the it's a vector sum of the components components in three directions so let me here i have written this al is nothing but direction cosine and then the vector sum of the components l can be 0 0 1 1 0 0 0 1 0 so a, a sum of component three components in x uh, a b c or x y z whatever you want to say direction and the multiple gives him the the magnetic magnet vector at a certain lattice site now if there is only 0 0 one component then i can write it as m i is nothing but m i 0 0 1 so that means in this diagram in this diagram now it is in the the moments are in the 0 0 1 direction so then i can write m i equal to m i 0 0 1 now since this magnetism is a periodic property either it is repeating every unit cell two unit cells or maybe thousand unit cells any periodic function we know math from mathematics that you can do a fourier expansion in terms of vectors in the Brillouin zone. What is a Brillouin zone? A Brillouin zone is, let me just explain to you, if these are the nearest neighbors, nearest neighbors at a distance A, then in the K space, I can draw a line to the nearest vector in the reciprocal space at 1 by a and then draw a perpendicular vector to that and that's the my first Brillouin zone and this is at pi by a and minus pi by a if I take the origin here so this distance is this is known as a Brillouin zone in reciprocal lattice space so so now in this Brillouin zone there are various values of k vectors allowed k vectors in a crystal lattice and i can write down the magnetization vector magnet vector at a site in terms of a fourier components m i k it to the power minus twice pi i k t k is that propagation vector and t is the translation if there is only one propagation vector for the system then I can write it as m i equal to m i k this summation will have a single component twice pi i k t let me just explain it with an example I just take an antiferromagnetic order in one direction this is a plane and the direction uh, switches between plus and minus from one plane to another as you go in C direction. Now I am going in C direction, so my translation T is in C direction, it is 0, 0, 1. And my moment is along the B direction as I showed in the drawing, along the B direction. So I can write in some units, this is 
zero one zero. So moment is zero one zero. Translation is zero zero one. Now let us see. In this case, when it's an antiferromagnetic alignment, if I take a propagation vector of zero zero half, what happens? So propagation vector is zero zero half. So m. After one translation, what happens? It is zero one zero in the base plane. Then exponential minus twice minus twice pi i k dot t. Now k dot t is how much? Let us see. K is Zero zero half the propagation vector for the antiferromagnet I have chosen, and t is zero zero one. So this term becomes e to the power exponential minus twice pi i zero zero one dot zero zero half into half. So it becomes e to the power minus twice pi i. Pi i, sorry. Half is the pi i exponential minus pi i. So now, so this is what I have written. So now let me go back and calculate it out. So my moment was zero one zero in the plane I showed. e to the power minus i pi is 0 1 0 cos pi minus minus i sin pi 0 minus 1 it is equal to 0 minus 1 0 So after translation of t, my magnetic moment has become zero minus one zero from zero one zero. That's exactly what I have shown in the diagram. That it is an antiferromagnetic order. So zero one zero. This is zero one zero, zero minus one zero. So given this magnetic propagation vector, there is only one propagation vector here, which is k equal to zero zero half, which I could for this I could straight away guess because the It's very clear. L became two L, so K becomes half. So instead of uh, T, which is one, because it is two T now, my K is half. Very easy to guess in this case. I have taken it from this yeah. reference. So, but while you are fitting a magnetic sample data, we need to start with a guess of the propagation vector. I would say. Uh, Physically reasonable guess, which comes from knowledge in magnetic structures. Like I showed you here, various kinds of alignments. For example, this is a ferromagnetic uh, sample. Here, actually, the propagation vector will be zero zero one. In the previous diagram, what I showed as for an antiferromagnet, it is zero zero half. It is zero zero one. Here, it will be zero zero half. This is a ferromagnet. Ferromagnet. So then, with every t, I also have to add an alpha t. That means the length of the vectors are also changing. Not just that they are changing in uh, size, and they are also changing in size. Similarly, this is a triangular kind of lattice. It's a canted lattice. It's a umbrella kind of lattice where all of these vectors we have to represent in terms of a, b, c, and then the the reciprocal lattice. And in the reciprocal lattice in the Brillouin zone, I can choose a set of k vectors which can give this correctly. I show a sine or cosine kind of variation. You can see the length. There is a ferry magnet, but the length of the moment is changing. Similarly, there is a circular helix where, as we go ahead or as we go in one direction, here for simplicity, I can consider it as zero zero one direction. The magnetic moment keeps rotating, and finally comes back to its original direction after 
a certain number of lattice points and 2 pi divided by that will be the propagation vector and the direction of H A plus K B plus L C. Then this is an elliptic orbit. So here not only it is rotating, the size is also changing and there are various possible uh, structures in magnetic uh, crystallography that you can consider and are being considered and that is a pa part of the game of solving a magnetic structure. But in the Ritwell refinement, about Ritwell refinement, what I want to say, that is a least square fitting technique. That means you start with a diffraction pattern in hand. So, <clears throat> I have got a experimental diffraction pattern, if experimental diffraction pattern, I can say I or Y experimental, which you have measured at a certain temperature, theta or Q. And on the other hand, you have got a calculated pattern and I have to compare these two. That means at every point, my every point where I have measured the data, every point I measured the data, I also have a model data. I have considered a model and have generated this and I am comparing these two patterns. So, I have got, I have got Y experimental, this is very common. I have got Y model, I have to minimize the values of them, but then there are many points. So, sum over I, if I want, depending on physical reasoning, I can put a weight factor over here. So, I have to calculate this and this is known as a weight, I, various names can be given, but this is fundamentally, this is the numerical comparison between two models that I am using for my fitting. So, as I said, so here it is error, I wrote A and then it is the weighted sum of the difference between the observed or experimental which I said and the calculated value. The intensity of diffraction at every angle again is a convolution of several parameters. Like you have the, the convolution of R theta which is resolution, then wavelength dispersion, then a sample related part plus a background and the convolution is something I must mention that the convolution is if there is a function y1 theta, I mean let me say in terms of x minus x prime y2 x prime dx integration of that is the convolution convoluted value at a point x. So, experimentally suppose I have got a peak like this. Now, if my instrumental resolution is a Gaussian like this, then each and every point will tend to spread out based on that Gaussian and then I will have a broader peak. Whereas, this is the theoretical peak and this is the convoluted peak. So, Apart from these two, over there when I wrote, I have got resolution function, I have got a wavelength dispersion because the wavelength of neutrons that I use is not unique. I use a band of neutrons because I need intensity. If I try to make it monoenergetic, I get very few neutrons, so I have got a band of. Then there is a sample, there can be a preferred orientation in the sample, there can be strain in the sample. If I know them, then I will they also will cause broadening, I will put as S theta and then there is a background because anywhere I do the experiment, there will be a background neutrons and that at every angle it will have a value and whereas the calculated value has to be convoluted with all these, then and then only I can compare the calculated value convoluted with all these with the experimental value. And with this, I come 
the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, I have given a very general expression for the Ridwell refinement, but now I will tell you specifically what are the inputs. There are several tutorials available online which I will give you the references and I will also mention like what are the parameters, important parameters that can be given, that needs to be given in a Ridwell refinement program. So let me emphasize once again, this is actually making a given model more and more commensurate with the experimentally observed pattern known as Ridwell refinement. It was done by Hugo Ridwell and give the program. The program name is Full Prof and it's a very very important program uh, suit which is used heavily and for the magnetism society this is possibly the most important package in use today. So I will come back to Ridwell refinement in the next lecture. Uh, I will briefly mention, give you some examples and then we will go ahead.